It's so cool that it works. Yeah. <laughs> All we're right. live. Oh, we're what's live. up? We're live. Live. We're live, 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 live. Live and direct to you. Coming at you in your living room. And in our living room. Or wherever you're at in your living room. We just saw uh, everybody's living room. How you guys doing? How you guys doing? We got we got 114 people in the room so far. And uh, I know a lot of people are gonna be pouring in. Uh, we're gonna monitor the chat. Definitely start commenting in there, throwing some comments, say what's up. We'll say hello to you. Introduce yourself. Daniela, <laughs> first host. Shout out to Daniela. Hello. Daniela, number one. Beat you to it. Yeah, I <laughs> said beat you to it. Nicely okay. done, Tim. Hello. Jonathan, hello. Jonathan, what's, what's, up? Up? what's up, guys? Um, Josh, what is up? Minna, what is up? Hey guys, you know what's crazy? You know what's crazy? So I had a um I had a high school student reach out to me today um on LinkedIn and said that she was interested in product management. That was really cool. That was really That's cool. Awesome, man. Yeah, because like awesome. cause like it wasn't even on my radar as a job family when I was, you know, when like when I was growing up in high school, yeah. like, it wasn't a thing. And it was really cool to see somebody from high school like, hey, is it okay if I join the session? I'm like, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 This is right. free information. That's right. Yeah. What's <laughs> happening, Joseph? What's going on, Jing? How you doing? Samir, hey, what's going on, Corey? Rebecca. Wow. All you right, know, where, where are y'all from? Where where's the farthest location that we have away from the Western United States. <laughs> and by the way, y'all, make sure that you all are tagging us and sharing what you all are learning throughout the night on yeah, LinkedIn. Yeah. Be sure to tag Alex, John, and I throughout yeah. the night. Shout out to Rebecca. She's tuning in from Seattle. Seattle. And why Seattle. see Guatemala, Sophia. Damn. All right, Boston. Pakistani. Whoa, whoa, whoa. John. That's pretty. That's pretty far. Dude, right that's there. far. That's far. Canada Egypt. representing Egypt. Maine. East Coast Canada, DC, Damn. NYC. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, Austin, Maryland, Dubai, Houston. Dubai. Wow. Toronto, everybody, man. We got people piling in. Bogota, Colombia. That is my favorite place on earth, by the way. Bogota, Colombia, and Medellin. I have some family in Medellin. A beautiful, beautiful place. Great people. <laughs> um, India. That's right. Is there a video? Is there a video chat? Um, Oh wait, so uh, so many comments. Is that there a cool. is there a video feed? Uh, uh, a video feed? You should see us. Do you guys yeah. see us? <laughs> uh, like, yeah, just I can, see us. I see you. Do you guys see us? Confirm in the comments. Do you see us? Let us know if you see us. We have over two hundred and twelve people viewing from all over the world. Yo, this is amazing. Um, you know, I'm gonna get a poll going really quickly. Yeah, we got San Francisco. San Francisco in the house. San Fran in the house. Connecticut. Uh, New Jersey Bay Area, Maryland. People just pouring in. Managers. Cyrus, what's up, man? Thanks for stopping by. Shout to Cyrus. And do you guys see us on video? Please, someone confirm. I don't see. I don't see that somebody's confirmed yet. Um, California, New York City. We see you. We see your beautiful faces. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. That's a good confirmation. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Philly, Philly, Rutgers, Panama City. Boom, boom. But like people are just. Oh, I can't even. This is like comments are coming in so fast. I don't even know the, the hell is going on. LA, LA, San Francisco, Minnesota. Hoda, Minnesota. Erica, California, California. I see you. See you. What's up, guys? What's going wow, on? Wow, we have two hundred ninety-five people. It's only getting larger. We this is like this is like a concert. It's a con it's a concert. You guys are you guys are arriving at a concert at a product management concert. A social distancing product management. I'm not seeing any video. Carrie says. All right, who el who is seeing video? New York, New York. You know, speaking South of product, Africa. speaking of product management, guys, I'm going to ask Alex and Tim real quick. How do you like this tool, Webinar Jam, as a I product? Think, Alex, I'll let you go first, man. Oh man, it's been a solid five minutes uh, using this as a product, so you know, I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm in the right place to to You're give in the an right opinion. place. Yeah, you are. You no, are. it feels good. It feels it good. Feels good. Uh, yeah, from a, just a, a basic user experience. Well, first of all, I'm in. I'm using it. We've got 300 over 300 people here with us. 
So yeah, first first impressions pretty solid. We can go into it, you know at length uh, yeah. analysis a little bit later on. Exactly, yeah. exactly. We'll yeah. do that. We'll do that. I See, agree. I agree too, man. It's it's smooth. It's smooth. John and I, you you and I use this a lot for a lot of the webinars we do for our community. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a great tool. It just it's really simple to use. The buttons are there. It's really intuitive. The color coding on the buttons they're nicely separated. It's just easy. That's what we love. Abby is saying we should run a PM conference. Abby. Hmm, Abby, that's a great idea. Hosting this that. This is a PM <laughs> conference right here, actually. That's right. And we, and we, have, we, have, your, we have your email address, so we will, we will notify you of the PM conference. Of the PM conference. That um, is such by the a way, great folks, idea, uh, supposedly you're supposed to hit the play button if you're missing video. Apparently, that's, that's the tips around chat. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, you all Watching should from Singapore. You all should be seeing us. Video quality is good. Ali says, "Okay." And also, Tim, your quality, your video quality is better right now, so I can see you much better. This is awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you did get better, man. You did get better. Yeah, yeah. This is really, really good. You guys look like y'all are celebrities, man. <laughs> it's great. It's great. No, your lighting is amazing, Alex. I know you got some good lighting, man. Well, for you know, real, I prepare dude. for the event. He's got important. guitars in the background. I yeah, know. one of them is missing a string, but don't pay too, too close attention. Uh, you know. <laughs> totally, totally. Nick, Nick is saying, "Let's get Nick, started." Nick's, Are y'all ready? Nick's like in it. Yeah, yeah. And John, thanks for holding. Uh, yeah. All right. Cool. 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 By the way, um, sounds like I'm listening to a podcast. That's great. Yeah. That's good. That's that's, that's our the, intention that's goal. here. Yes. So, by the way, for everyone who's in. We're going to have a recording that's sent to you as well, so you won't miss a beat. Also, if you are active on LinkedIn or you're just starting to create your personal brand, or you're learning about product management, something along those lines, definitely tag each one of us in the things that you learned. One key takeaway, something can, that can help other people with the takeaway that you learned from this evening, right? The more, the more you share content, um, the more you can grow your own personal brand, right? The more you can help others. It creates a follow-on effect for this whole community, okay? Yeah. So, um, so definitely start thinking about those takeaways for the evening. Create a even a, a micro post about it. Hey, had a session tonight with these three awesome dudes. Here's what we learned. Yeah, All right. I love it. I love it. I love it. By the way, y'all, this is not going to be another boring, stuffy product management. No, product. hell no. <laughs> well, I was going to do some boring, stuffy stuff. Yeah, I was gonna do some boring shit. Yeah, for sure. All right. So I, I have a poll going, John and Alex, and I asked how many of you all are currently product managers? We have 91% of the people say, I want to be. I want to be. And only 8% of the people who are currently tuning in are cool. product managers currently. Great to know. Great to and, know. you know, are y'all ready for us to get started? Let's do this. Let's do it. Let's do it. So welcome, y'all, on welcome. how to break into product. And, yeah. you know, I am your host, Tim Salau. I'm going to be moderating between these amazing fellas today, and we're just going to be chatting, right? And yeah. we have an outline of what we're going to focus, but I would love for John and Alex to, one, introduce themselves, and then I'll introduce myself. John, you go first, man. Yeah, so uh, I'm a senior product manager at Amazon. I've been at Amazon for uh, about three and a half years now. I'm on a team called New Business Innovation. And so we're working on some really cool user experiences for some innovative products um, on Amazon. And I'm Alex. I'm also senior PM at Google. Uh, I've been at Google a couple of years now. I work in ads. I used to work yeah. in Play and Android, kind of uh, all over the place. Yeah. Um, before that, I used to spend a lot of time in mobile apps and mobile games, designing things like that, and some startups yeah. and consulting. So happy to chat with you all today. Yeah. You know, and so you all are, are talking to a, a few pretty tenured product managers. So I, my name is, hi all, my name is Tim Salau. I am the CEO. I sound like hi all. Right? Hey, y'all. I'm the CEO of Guy, the bite-sized skills training platform for remote teams. And I formerly worked with Microsoft, Facebook, Google, in a variety of different roles. One being AI product management as well as design. And, you know, one of the, the, the common things that John, Alex, and I, all we all share is we love product. We're obsessed with product. We talk about it every single day. 
And more importantly, you know, we really have very interesting stories in how we got into product management, right? Alex, I would love for you to share a little bit about how did you get into product, right? Because I think everyone often asks this question, right? It's one of the number one questions you ask when you're speaking or when you're doing the work that is a product manager's role. You know, how did you kind of fall into this role, Alex? Sure. Yeah. And, and John was saying at the beginning of the call that, uh, you know, when, uh, when he was in high school and he hasn't even heard of product management. So that's, that's definitely very much the, the same with me in college. Uh, and when working in business, I did not really know that I was in product management until I was like several years in, in it. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, it's kind of like a very uh, understood, more understood role. Yeah. And uh, I spent some time just building stuff and mm. uh and trying to improve it for for various groups of people like uh, sales i did a lot of sales i did a lot of um app web design um these type of products and uh, eventually got into uh, gaming mobile gaming and from there oh. once i was basically uh running uh, entire mobile gaming studios that's when i realized that i was actually uh, into product management. That's what I was doing. The whole time I was basically trying to run a business, optimize it, improve the experience for the users and kind of walk the line between users and business. That was product management. And so yeah. eventually applied to Google. Uh, turns out they do product management as well. And <laughs> they, out, right? they, they do a lot of it, right? Yeah. Apparently, yeah. And, and <laughs> they appreciate like the background that essentially all these things that I have built in the past and, uh, and, and uh, the people that I've worked with, the different groups of, of different developers, designers, you know, uh, uh, user research, data scientists, all that, that's, that's the domain of the product manager to interact with all those folks and build awesome stuff. Yeah. And that's how I ended up in Google. There's some more details in there, but basically that's what it was. Yeah. Wow, that's the roadmap. What about you, John? Yeah. I mean, for me, product manager. So, um, so I, I had a, a, company that I started uh, back in 2002. I was in college at the time. It kind of dates me how old I am. <laughs> uh, uh, but I was, in, I was in college at the time, a, a junior, and I wanted to start a company because I really wanted to build something. Now, it wasn't an app or anything like that. It was literally a retail electronics business. I did that for 10 years, uh, grew that to a, a couple million in sales, sold the company, poured all my earnings into a software development startup. I was really wow. fascinated by smart home technology at the time. This was, this was, mind you, around the 2012, 2013 timeframe when there really wasn't a concept of like Alexa or Google Home. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was uh, kind of deeply entrenched into this arena for 10 years with all this technology that had to actually be like hardwired in your house. You know, a lot of smart home tech that was just starting to be wireless and the touch screens that were available weren't like iPod, I iPads. It was like the iPad device, touch screen, Android device that was sold proprietary by the manufacturer that was like $1,000 that you put in your wall and it only yeah. did like home automation, right? And so I was kind of at this time when I thought, okay, well, how can I create a suite of products that is like a Google Home before Google Home mm -hmm. even existed to do automated shade control and automated, uh, you know, lights and throw an iPad in the wall and do like, you know, custom wall mounted iPads and touchscreen wall controllers and things like that. So I uh, was going back and forth to China, um, building this whole kind of portfolio of products. Um, oh. And uh, I had a team of people that I, that I brought together. We created six apps, iOS apps for this one that was like a shade controller one that was like the whole ecosystem controller for lights and thermostat and things like that um i was i, I was into that for two years and um i knew nothing about product management oh. all i all, yeah like i literally knew i was like i gotta create some software i have no idea how to do it so <laughs> so i need to get some people to to help me with that That's and awesome. uh yeah. And then, and then um, there, there was, I never was introduced to the idea of like a discipline of product management. Mm. And so um, after about two, a little over two years, th the cracks started showing in this, right? It was like yeah. a lack of knowledge on myself. B, we were like super ambitious. We were actually trying to pre-sell to the FA Porsche building in Miami. I, I had moved to Miami, Florida, specifically to start up this company with a partner who had this like $150 million a year, like 
custom flooring business. And he knew all these like architects and designers in Miami who are doing these massive high rises. And the FA Porsche building is the building that brings up your supercar in an elevator to your condo. So wow. you can look at it while you're actually walking through the, the, the hallway. Right. And so here we are like trying to pre-sell our shit <laughs> to these like $20 million uh, condos. And we were selling the problem was that our product wasn't working very well. <laughs> so we learned pretty quickly that this was just not a scalable solution uh, for radio, you know, like radio based, um, you know, radio wireless radio frequency based technology. Um, cause, cause like the ecosystem just wasn't there yet. Right. So mm -hmm. like we were kind of ahead of our time, but anyway, that's a long winded way of saying that's kind of my first foray into product. Yeah. I, I think what's so pa fascinating is that, you know, both of you, uh, you know, similar, similar to you all, we, we didn't really have a solid footing of, Oh, what we were doing at the time was product management. No. I know, you know, before I got, uh, I started working with Microsoft, I was just working at UT Austin getting my master's degree and I was yeah. just collaborating with a whole bunch of people building things for our, our university. And then I just kind of fell in and, and found a passion for it. You yeah. know, I want to ask you all, you know, was, was learning through failure, how you all kickstarted your product management career? John, I'll let you go first, man. Um, yeah, it, it was cause I, cause I wanted to really explore the discipline further, right? Like, why did I fail? Um, and you know, why did I get dragged through the trenches? How could I have done better? Yeah. What, what could I have done differently? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, er everything was like really trial and error at the time. If I, if I knew what I know now, it, I, it would have been a completely different outcome. Yeah. But that's the learning experience, right? Yeah, that's true. So I want to show love to our amazing attendees daniel is saying hook them shout out to you daniel abby is saying hook them you know rustam is asking what are the core tools and skills you rec recommend beginners to learn alex i want you to answer that what are the core tools and skills you recommend beginners to learn sure sure i'm pretty sure it's rustam i could be wrong about yeah, that. yeah, yeah. My, you probably are right <laughs> my my one of my best friends name is rustam so uh core tools and skills you recommend beginners learn uh, well, I think the meta advice there is uh, I don't think it makes sense to actually um, focus on the tools too much, uh, especially like as a beginner. I think that as a true beginner, I think uh, you want to focus on beefing up your communication skills probably above all else, which sounds – that kind of sounds like maybe, a, you know, like – a uh not like a real answer but but actually that's probably 80 percent of the job i'd love to hear you know john's take on it but effectively you're constantly interacting with different groups of people who have different personal characteristics and professional attributes and you're somehow trying to make all of these people work together for a common goal unfortunately i had like maybe five hours worth of meetings today and sitting in this <laughs> chair and like a lot of that time you're you're either driving to get meetings to actually be productive or you're trying to understand what it is we're actually doing uh, instead of just you know talking uh or you're trying to you know uh convince someone of your point of view so there's just so much to this communication piece that i would learn everything there is about you know communication persuasion different types of people there are like the different personality types you don't have to get like too in depth into this but just so you have a basic understanding of you know, verbal communication, nonverbal communication, all that stuff. I find that a lot of folks, uh, maybe it's it's basically not, it's not really taught a yeah. lot during like a regular kind of education curriculum. So folks kind of skip that part. Uh, but as a, as a future PM, I would go all in on communication for starters. And we can talk more about like the different like methodologies to learn. There's a, you know, there's a bunch of stuff to learn. I'm sure we can touch upon that. But if I had to choose one thing, it, I would start from that. I love that, Alex. John, what are your thoughts on that, man? Yeah, I mean, communication is key. It's a lot of persuasion, a lot of politician type work that you have to do. <laughs> you got to right? be diplomatic. Yeah, you do. You have to be diplomatic. You have to understand stakeholders' needs, why they do what they do. Uh, but, you know, I mean, prioritizing things based on the needs of our customers is that is is the the foundational piece of this right we have to 
peer into the to the mindset of our customers, listen to them, and it's just as important to listen to what they're not saying as it is to what they are saying. Because if you look at the 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 way that Apple built the iPhone is really fascinating, right? Apple knew the technology that they had and what they could do. The users had only context of what they currently had and improvements to it. Mm-hmm. So if you think of they had keyboard type BlackBerry devices, screens, there wasn't really a concept of a touchscreen device. There wasn't really a concept of pinching and zooming on a web browser, right? All they knew was that through observation, observed behavior, they found that it's really interesting. These are what these users are doing, not necessarily what they're saying. And we have the technology that we hypothesize if we put this and this and this together, it's going to be a breakout success. And it was a breakout success because they knew what they could build and they listened to what the customers were not saying, but what they were mm. behaving. So that, that's a really critical thing for, for, for product managers. And, and once you have that insight, then it's about ruthless prioritization, right? It's like, yeah. what is the most important thing they need? And what is the quickest amount of time that a developer can actually produce something, right? Mm. Time to market, the, 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 the minimal time to market and maximum impact is the things that we, I mean, I tend to like prioritizing um, because that that's going to give the most impact. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I love what you two are, are saying, and you know, we have a flood of questions coming in right now, and I, I think I want to touch a little bit about what you were just speaking on, John. You know, first of all, why is prioritization so important to, to product management? John, are you muted or are we delayed? Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Good. John yeah. muted right. himself. The product, <laughs> the product <laughs> holds. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so it in most product teams, there's a backlog of work that can be infinite. Yeah. There's a million different things that we all want to get to, and a product manager's job is sifting through all of that stuff and trying to create a narrative because the backlog of things and and guys for you, for, for those of you who, who don't know a backlog is literally just a, a a number of potentially yet to be defined problems that you want to solve it's a bunch of features that you want to do and the pm looks in the backlog and there might be 300 items in there and you go what's the story here yeah you know and and what is the most important thing for our customers so and and that's why communication like alex is touching on is so critical because you have to bring out the narrative of the things that are most important for the customer and then communicate to the stakeholders why it's so critical and the first thing they're going to go is like well what's the impact yeah. what's the impact why the hell would i do this i have 30 developers burning through thousands of dollars per hour in a one hour meeting, right? Like I, if I can't waste their time and they're highly technical and they're going to question everything I do. So I have to rally them around, Hey guys, if we do this, we're solving their problem and we're going to grow revenue by $300 million. And they go, Holy shit. Okay. We'll do that. Right. Yeah. Alex, what if, how, how, you know, you were speaking earlier about the power of communication and influencing and really being able to read the nonverbal and verbal, you know, how have you applied that when it comes to leading product teams? And I want you to answer that. And then I'm going to address some of the questions that the people are, are asking. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I'd love to uh, go through the chat questions. There are just so many questions and, and I think we got answers for basically all of them. I like <laughs> so <laughs> I definitely want to get to it. Um, to answer your question, uh, Usually product managers are going to come into this weird, ambiguous environment where nothing really makes sense. Like the more complex a project you're working on, and usually the more senior product manager, the bigger the scope. So you might think of it as like a a director of product management might have an entire suite, Mm -hmm. like a product suite. And a senior product manager might have a direction within that suite, within that application. And then a more junior product manager might have a couple of features within that app. So and at any stage there that you come into, you're going to be facing a weird, ambiguous state where 
just like John said, should we do this thing or should we do that thing? And how do we know if we should do this or that thing? And so the ruthless prioritization comes in where when you have to figure out a way to compare apples and oranges and do it in a, in a meaningful uh, way that you can actually say, yes, I'll do this, or I think we should do that because of these factors. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of influencing people, when you step into that role, you figure out which direction the product should go or the feature set or the overall suite of products, you've got to then bring people with you. Uh, sometimes people have this wrong impression that product managers are the sole decision makers in the company. That's really like closer to the opposite. The, C the CEO, the CEO, yeah. right? No. So it's so much closer to the opposite because, you know, you have an opinion, man, and you've got uh, some thoughts maybe backing that up, but now you've got to get everybody together. So you're thinking, okay, what what, what are the sets of, of things that we can both prioritize like that is in both of our team's interests or or kind of speaks to the priorities of this of this team or this person or interest this this particular person or group of people because of what they've done in the past so you'll talk to to, to developers sometimes differently than you will talk to product manager or ux designers or researchers data scientists you got to motivate each group to basically help you move the product along and this this is like super fresh super ongoing stuff i literally did some of the stuff today last week you know last month so very much using communication how do i influence this person and then trying to trying to move it incrementally forward man all of these rich questions that are flooding in are mind-boggling so really let are. me yeah. let me go ahead and pick a few right now yeah. to let's do it do we have a way to to do, speaking can, of this uh, product management uh, right thing, like is there a place where we can actually see all these questions lined up uh you know what? nope <laughs> they don't have that well, feature <laughs> and it would be great if people could vote on the questions so then right away we could get the maximum impact to what john was talking that's right. about that's yeah, right yeah, that's so, yeah. true. so true so, right because this is prioritization right how do we prioritize this the comments are a backlog for us right now we're like well, how do, what do we answer exactly. What's important? so so i you know let's tr i'm gonna randomly pick some and i think we we definitely can chew through a few and then uh you know i'll get back to asking a few other questions yeah. so you know one of the questions that we have is how can new grads find opportunities as a pm other disciplines can easily show a portfolio but isn't the same for a pm what advice do you have and this is from fuad yeah you want to yeah. take that yeah, I can take it. I, I yeah. think that's that's a great question. Uh, there's a couple of things to optimize for. You want to optimize for being noticed. And I think that's probably the question. When you submit your resume, how is it going to get noticed compared to the folks with a, with a technical background or the business background? And I think the way to do that is by launching a business or assisting with the launch of a business or moving a business forward or mm -hmm. um or collaborating with a large group of people it could be even organizing successful events so mm -hmm. anything where you were able to move some kpis and basically some 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 uh some metrics forward uh is an example of of the abilities that you need as a product manager so mm -hmm. A lot of times startup founders or co-founders or people early stage uh, employees or people that have just been involved in, in highly or organizationally heavy um, events would get picked for interviews because it's the same it's the same uh, background that you actually need There's a lot of overlapping experience so they might pick MBAs because again that's where a lot some of some of the stuff is taught but they will also pick the startup founders and co-founders because that's where some of the stuff is done. Mm, mm, powerful answer, powerful answer. So John, this one's for you, man. You know, uh, so this is, Abhishek is a recent graduate set to be a PM at a non-tech company like Capital One. What experience should you be seeking out if you wanna make the shift into the tech industry? Yeah, I mean, the shift in the tech industry, I think there might be a misconception a lot of times where you need an, a, a technical background. I know this question was coming through uh, in the comments quite a bit, <clears throat> that you need a technical background to be a product manager. And that, that's not necessarily true. You need empathy. You need to really, it's, it's human behavioral psychology, really. Mm. I mean, that's really what it is. You have to be really good at listening 
to what people are saying between the lines. And this happens all the time. We'll get customer feedback and we'll go, well, that's direct, interesting feedback, but there's a deeper story here. They can't articulate it because they don't know the capabilities that we have, which is why we often ask these questions like these magic wand questions. Like hypothetically, mm -hmm. if you had a magic wand, how would you design this product? What yeah. would you want? What would you do? Because they don't know the technology, right? So that kind of expands their thinking um, outside of that linear path of like incremental improvement. And so I think that, you know, for me, I went to coding school. Uh, I did a six month program. I hated it, guys. I, <laughs> I, 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 I utterly, it utterly destroyed my soul. Mm. Um, but, and, but the reason I did it, it was very strategic because I thought that I would need a tech background, but actually I don't. It's, you know, in some ways, it's kind of nice to know a couple high level things to talk to engineering team, but largely they really just want to know what is the problem we are going to solve. Mm -hmm. And they need to know concisely through my writing, which is just human writing. It's not technical writing. It's human writing. What are we solving and what's the impact and what are we prioritizing? Yeah. So, so I think that, you know, that's the key guys. You don't have to be an engineer to be a product manager. And what's, what's, what's great about it for a lot of you who are in the comment section that are like trying to transition from engineering to product, more power to you. That, mm. Right? Because you, you understand some of those architectural things and encoding uh, constraints and things like that. But at the end of the day, if you're a user experience type product manager, you, you don't really need to know coding. And that's my, my impression. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I want to touch on this a little bit. And by the way, Thank you all for all of the rich questions that you all are asking. Yeah, this is awesome, guys. I love and this. I, we're having a field day with this. I love this. And thank you all for mentioning us on LinkedIn. Make sure to mention John, Alex, and I. If you are taking notes and you're learning a ton, we are definitely going to show you some love and reach and, and not retweet, but post and comment and reshare your your posts on LinkedIn. So make sure that you're doing that. So you know, I, I love what you're what you two are saying, John and Alex. You know, I think you know, a lot of people are so scared because they don't feel as if they are coming into product management with that traditional MBA or going to that traditional business school or attending Stanford University, right? So they kind of beat themselves up. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that you guys have said is that you all learned through trial and error. You all have built businesses. And more importantly, you all saw the opportunity and realized, oh, wait, I have the skill set and weren't afraid to pitch yourselves for the role, right? And, you know, this kind of touches on a mindset that a lot of product managers all have, right? Like there's a lot of resilience to product management because you're always having to say no. And you're more importantly, you're always having to pitch an idea. You're always having to, you know, uh, come come and, and be confident. You know, I would love to ask you all, you know, what, what would you all describe the mindset required to be a successful and effective product manager? Alex, I'll let you take this one first. The mindset for an effective product manager. Um, yeah. Get some sleep so you <laughs> have energy, I think, was just from personal experience because, you know, you got to stay optimistic. You, you somehow have to stay optimistic <laughs> at all times. John knows what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. I think that one's an important one. I think another one, um, I was actually thinking of doing a video on the topic of uh, what qualities, like, why you should not be a product manager hmm. and and here here's the here's why i'm thinking about it like this i think you have to like people in general and yeah. you have to like interacting with people you can still do the product manager's job if you don't but it is going to be much easier if you do and so this is more you know it's hard to put yourself there's there's lots of different folks out there you know there's there's obviously um uh uh folks that prefer you know large companies small gatherings you know and they'll behave differently in different situations but ultimately uh, I, I think like a, a very very simplistic way uh, to describe the the introvert extrovert like classically is that uh, generally someone who will get energized from a meeting with a lot of people with a lot of interesting mm -hmm. conversation I think is a person that will all things being equal do better in product management than someone who loses energy from that. And I think if you put yourself in either of those camps, you you know what I'm talking about because we, we all kind of fall on the spectrum somewhere in the middle, but we, we can feel either we we deplete our energy reserves or we actually gain them. So after this this webinar that we're doing right now, I'm going to be amped up. I'm not going to be exhausted <laughs> at all. 
right? Yeah. But but some folks would be, and so mm. this this is the mindset. You know, it's 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 not exactly mindset because it's difficult sometimes to change like the way that you are. But that's an important thing for you to, to pay attention to and understand. I think a lot of the stuff that you know, John, Tim, you guys speak of is that you got to optimize for yourself. Also, ultimately, you don't, you shouldn't mm. be going to product management because. It's an it's it's the, the 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 best career in tech right now. It's highly paid and sought after. You should be doing the things that are going to eventually make you happy and all that stuff. You guys are the experts in this in this field, but this really speaks to it. So, like the mindset is optimism and desire to help others. You want to mm. build stuff. You want to solve problems. You're going to like it. It's not going to be easy. You're not going to come in and just call the shots. We'll do this. We'll do that. It's not like that at all. Yeah. But the process is very iterative. It's very enjoyable if you like to interact with people and help solve people's problems. John, it seems, it's helpful. I love that, Alex. You know, that's powerful, man. John, what are your thoughts on this, man? You, you seem eager to, to address this question, man. Yeah, man. Um, I uh, that, That's a great way to put it. Energy versus de-energy. I mean, that, yeah. that's, really the, that's really the bottom line. That's really the bottom line. Um, you got, yeah, I mean, I'm, really, I'm, I'm like, like literally it's a joke. It's a joke that we have back to back meetings. Like yeah. the entire day is back like 9am to 5pm. It doesn't stop. And I'm like, did I go pee today? I don't know. Let me, let me do did that. I eat today? Let me do that real quick. Right. Yeah. Because each, each meeting is an alignment. Mm. It's a misunderstanding. You're, 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 you're taking, you're, you're like a, um, you got a pile of Legos on the ground. You got a, you got a few of them built and you're looking at the roadmap and going, okay, okay. Another gap, another gap of lack of understanding. Cool. I got to write, I got to write something. I got to write another requirement. I got to write some requirements. I got to write a document to kind of clarify our thinking around this. And then everybody kind of jumps into the document and says, well, I, I disagree with this. And you go, okay, that's fascinating. That's a different perspective. Let me get back to you, right? So it, it literally might take, like it might take two weeks of nonstop reviewing a document. And this is, this is just like an Amazon thing maybe, but it takes two weeks of nonstop reviewing a document that might only be like two pages, size 10 font, single spaced, dense, two pages, right? That took two weeks to write, first of all, and then it took another two weeks for like stakeholders to even think about aligning on it. Hmm. But- it's that it's that question that comes up that you address you you know you're pulling that comment into the document you're validating someone else's thoughts and opinions on a particular model or thing that you're building you know and 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 each person comments and then you see a document what winds up happening is you see less and less comments on the doc yeah. and then you know like everybody's bought into the idea and so the way that the ideas are formulated and solidified within Amazon is through that document writing process. And for some, it can be very painful. I actually kind of enjoy it in a way. It's kind of like therapeutic. It's like, okay, brick by brick, we'll get, we'll get there. Right. And then yeah. at the end of a couple of weeks, we have this thing that is an artifact of our thinking, our group yeah. thinking. It's really interesting. Yeah. So I want to address a few of the questions that we are being, being flooded with and one in particular by cm you guys are saying a lot of good things but when it comes down to it what skills are recruiters hiring managers going to look for when you are one of hundreds of applicants for a position empirically communication empathy is great but how do you demonstrate you have the skills to be the right fit for the position john thoughts on this man man okay okay so um i never applied to amazon Ooh. They, they found me. Okay. And so there's a critical piece here, guys, the apply and pray methodology. And this is something that Tim and I talk about all the time. The apply and pray methodology rarely ever works. What works is being strategic on LinkedIn and building a network and building in connections and leveraging places where you have emotional connection with other people universal story connections with other people, not just like bullet point resume story connections. It's like, I love to do this. You love to do this outside of work. That's where we connect, right? And reaching out to people like that, not, not um, recruiters, right? It's people that are just in roles who have a fascinating background where you're able to make that connection with. Um, so 
I think that's really key, guys. If you apply, you're going to be involved uh, with you know 200 other people that are trying to apply, and unfortunately, you're just a number at that point. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So, so Yanchen, Yanchen is I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but Alex, I want you to take this one. I, I think you and I can both answer address this one. You know, how does corporate culture shape product culture in Amazon, Google, and Microsoft? That's a great question. What are your thoughts, Alex? Oh boy. Uh, are we on the record here? What's going on? The camera's <laughs> We're on the record, man. We're, you got to be careful. You got to oh, be careful. Man. Um, <laughs> you know, the safest thing to say would just be that it affects it, man. Mm. It affects it. And I, yes. I don't know that that's – basically, look, if when you're running a startup that's just you and your buddy – it's not a lot of uh, like it's just two of you and that's your culture right there if you want to you know eat pizza on the couch or whatever that's your culture you want to work all, all day all night that's the culture but when you've got 5,000 people 10,000 20,000 how about a hundred thousand people trying to do something together um, you're gonna get you're gonna have to first of all slow things down you're gonna have to work things out and uh, I think it's 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 just very difficult to organize huge groups of people. And so I think the business kind of adapts to that. And I think there's no real way around that ultimately, because just more complexity. I think, you know, you can try to build like silos that basically um, try to focus on, on speed and other things in certain areas. But at the end of the day, it's still this gigantic company. So I think it does affect it. And uh, I think if you want to work at those places, you have to kind of prepare yourself that it's, it's going to change a little bit. Yeah. Mm. Got to deal with Probably the politics, man. That's a, that it, you know, that's not, that's not a big tech thing. That's at every company startup, large, middle, doesn't matter. There are mm. rampant politics at every organization. So yeah. um, that's just the name of the game, right? It's just, it's a matrix org. You have 5 million people's opinions. Yeah, yeah. So Carlos is saying, hey, gents, help grow a tech startup that was in hyper growth pre-COVID, was furloughed, decided to take this time to learn more about product. My experience is in operations and growth, user acquisition specifically. He's a user advocate. I want to put all this into product for my next big move, but don't necessarily have product um, background, minus being the eighth employee and growing our business to now acquired and growing. So he's trying to get in, but he doesn't necessarily feel as if, you know, he has the the core background. You know, what are, what are y'all y'all's advice for him? I think he's done. You're good to go, man. You, you, you're, ready to, you're, yeah. ready to, you're ready to get into product management. That's that's yeah. Really, yeah. a great background right there. John, please love to hear No, that, 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 I think, yeah, no, so anybody who's looking to transition into product management, you know, it's it's like we kind of wait for people to give us permission to break into an industry or break into a role. Yeah. And we can't wait for a manager to allow us to transition. We can't wait for a company to allow us to do it. Just like the startup mentality out there in the world, we just have to do it. And the way we do it is 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 non-traditional. We have to think, okay. I'm going to spend my time in the evenings to create a portfolio of projects that are product management related. I'm going to curate a portfolio of documents or things that I'm writing about product management, posts that I'm going to do on LinkedIn. I'm going to show that my process of learning about product. You know, it's funny because like when I when I when I joined American Express, it was my first corporate role in my in my early 30s after my second startup failed. And really I had no traditional product management background, right? But I convinced them to, to, to get into a senior product manager role at American Express. And the main reason I did that was because I showed a portfolio of work. I, I didn't direct them to my website or I didn't direct them to my, my resume. I directed them to my website and said, you know, like, let's not talk about my resume. I'd love to shift the focus here and talk about some of these exciting projects that I've worked on, on the side. And I had nine different projects with links, right? Um, Different, different things that I was kind of stress testing, thinking about the way certain apps were created and thinking of different solutions, writing samples, um, all of which showed my communication style, right? So guys, that is the key. And mm -hmm. remember that LinkedIn is the largest search engine for recruiters so in the true. world, right? So LinkedIn is Google for recruiters. 
And so they go on there and I go, I need someone in California with an IT background and blah, 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 blah. And then like people show up, right? And it's the people who have the completed profiles who show up at the top of search. It's the people who are the most relevant to the search query that show up at the top of search. But there's an algorithm at play, right? It's prioritizing the, the right results for the user who is the recruiter. And, um, and the more information that you have that you can showcase skills and the narrative around your transferable skills, the better. So, um, uh, you know, as soon as you, as soon as you start doing that, those opportunities will open up and you'll be, you'll be really surprised. Yeah. Yeah. So true. So true. You know, I, I think what's, what's one of the most important skill sets that, that comes with, with product management is navigating ambiguity. And we had a lovely question in the chat, you know, how do you two do that in your role? Uh, in terms of navigating ambiguity when you don't necessarily have all of the data points, all of the information, and it's just a really complex situation. Alex? How do you navigate ambiguity? Well, Tim, that was a, that's a doozy right there. He just dropped that one on me. I was kind of hoping John would take that one first, but all right. So uh, there's actually, there, there are things you can do. I think, uh, number one, stay calm. Just stay mm. calm and also look calm to other people in the meeting. Don't don't look like you're you're confused. You don't know what's going on. Don't do that because it drops the morale of all the other people in the room that are counting on you <laughs> to kind of guide them out of this forest. Um, so there's a couple of techniques. Uh, technique number one is up leveling. Uh, mm. I think uh, Elon Musk uh, is like first order principles. What do we know to be true? Which is awesome. Uh, so you basically, you just constantly ask why you're like, well, we need to do this feature. Why? Well, because our customers have asked for it. Why? Or because it solves this problem. Why? You're like hidden motivation. And then you start to, it just, it kind of peels back the, the onions. Uh, sorry, my kids are going to be yelling in the background every now and then. I just apologize. <laughs> <you> know. <laughs> so, so, um, so that's the first step is like, just keep asking why you're going to get more piece of information as you're going to get more piece of information. You write them down in your handy little notepad or your, or your docs that's open. And then later you can actually use those to, to see if you can find a common thread throughout those and build some new combinations. Uh, the other thing is you look for, again, those overlapping, um, interests. So groups of customers, groups of developers, Right, like you, you might have uh, different products. Like in your company, you might have several different product lines. How can you actually up level it so that the goal for both of those products, which seem to be at odds at first, actually lines up? Like it's hmm. when you go through some questions about like uh, thinking about some products for Facebook, it's easy to get lost in that because it's a giant company. And if you launch a feature, okay, you're launching your feature, maybe it's doing well, but what are you doing to Facebook overall? How are you changing the, the the goals that Facebook has set for itself? So you up level it, uh, and there's 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 ton of other techniques that you can actually look into. It's basically sort of like to to help you. Uh, you don't need to get 100% alignment, but you just need to pick out some things that look similar enough together where you can say, okay, I can kind of compare those things, and this is the parameter view which I'm going to be actually prioritizing it, and I'm going to hold everything else constant for now. And we're going to write the rest of the comments down in our little backlog or little notes, but we're going to try to make a decision. We're not going to try to make a decision at perfect. We're going to 80, 20, this thing, we're going to try to make a decision and then try to get people around you to yeah. actually agree with you and kind of move things forward. That's, that's my approach. I love it. So staying calm and really being able to up level. I think that's a really powerful one because, you know, and that's, that's product management level, level, level 10 all right um insights right there a man. little I'm, bit I'm, yeah like, yeah no that's a really that's really really good and i think you know even for the some of the beginners or even people who have been in prior roles that require them to do a little bit of product management that is a necessary skill that you need to be able to bring to the table and you know i've met early career pms who struggle with prioritization but also struggle with being able to go deep and then go go back up at a high level right it takes a lot of 
um, facilitation and influencing skills to be able to do that. So those are really great gems. You know, exactly. so Michael, you know, asked a really powerful question and I'm picking this question out because I think, you know, there's been a lot of talk around and a lot of questions around, you know, how do I transfer into this new role or how do I stand out throughout the interview process? And John, you've been talking throughout, you know, our, our webinar so far about the importance of networking, relationship building and LinkedIn. Michael is asking, John, you touched on the importance of LinkedIn and networking to bring to break into PM role and largely a career in tech. What do you think is the best approach to bringing value to people you reach out to and presenting this in a comp in a compact LinkedIn message or short conversation? Yeah, I mean, you have to reach out to. OK, so here's the here's something that Tim and I were actually talking about last night. Seventy percent of people, according to Gallup, are disengaged in their jobs. Nationwide, seventy percent. Okay, so, so here's 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 the fascinating thing. Like people have their day jobs, and there are elements of their day jobs that spark their interest, and there are good good parts about it. But a lot of people have passions outside of work that are like exceed their jobs. They do them just because they're they're super enjoyable. It's something that is like tied to their personal story and background. And you you have to. You have to find somebody who has written about that type of thing, who has a Medium article about their struggle or who has an about section on their LinkedIn profile that is similar to yours that like gets into not just their resume bullet points, but like into who they are at their core. Um, and a lot more people are starting to kind of share those things. And that is critical. To, to, to find that actual connection, right? Like somebody will look at my profile and be like, Hey, I, like I'm a cyclist too. Or like, mm -hmm. I had a business failure just like you. And, you know, I, at the time was in the pro, you know, like I was having a baby and, you know, I was broke after failure my startup. It's like, Oh man, like I know what this guy's feeling. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I really know. Um, and that's where I'm going to actually like be really willing to reach out to that individual. Whereas like the alternative strategy, if somebody says like, hey, I need a job or hello, sir, I need a job. And it's like, or, hey, do you have any openings in your team? Or can you like help me find a role? Like, can, like how stale is that, right? I, I, like, first of all, I don't know who you are. <laughs> you don't, you didn't take the time to understand like who I am, right? And so if you make that connection, it, it, it goes so far because it's a connection outside of the realm of work mm -hmm. so um so i think that's i think that's critical to, to to start doing that and if and if you are gonna speak about things like alex talked about peeling back the layers of the onion and this touches on the interview side of things as well guys when you're asking why 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 you have to apply that same filter through your resume why am i saying what i'm saying on my resume oh well i have to say this why am I saying that? What's my achievement? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, okay. Well, can you explain it to me? Like, it's funny because like we do consulting with people, you know, and it's, and it's hilarious. Like, because we'll ask somebody like, what was your biggest achievement? And they'll be like, well, they'll, they'll give me like a two page answer, you know, or like a 10 minute answer. And I'm like, but what was your achievement? Mm. Right. And so if you can't communicate it on paper on a resume, then you can't communicate it succinctly to someone that you're going to speak to as well. If you have a 30 minute conversation based on somebody's emotional connection and at the end they ask you like, how can they help you then? Uh, and you go, well, I need a job and you know, and then you can't articulate it. Then, then that's a problem. They don't know where to, where to help you with what. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you know, it's, it's, it's so funny. You, you, you do talk about the importance of, you know, personal branding and being able to network as well as understanding how to influence, because the, the way I got my first role with Microsoft as an AI product manager was through LinkedIn, you know, and John, I, I share this often and it was through me active, actively building my personal brand and sharing my thought leadership around what was so important to Microsoft at the time, which was artificial intelligence and it's still really important to Microsoft. And a corporate vice president found me and said, hey, I would love for you to join our team and, you know, interview um, for, for this role at Microsoft. So, you know, for me, LinkedIn has really been life changing. And ever since I've just been actively using that, not only, you know, to build my personal brand, but to also build, you know, our business that is guide now. So, you know, I can speak to just the power of LinkedIn and being power. able to network and, and build rapport with the right people. It, it could truly change your life. Yeah.
Yeah. John, we John, lost you're you. Muted, man. <laughs> Sorry, I got I got my son here too, and there's like background noise. So I'm trying to minimize. Um, but one question that keeps uh, coming up, and I really love to touch on this, is the uh, concept of whether or not an MBA is necessary to break into product. And I would, I personally would love to hear this from you, Alex, uh, of whether it's a general idea of like a recruiting layer saying like that's a prereq or not. John, you're gonna have to repeat your question. I was typing out. A, I'm trying to answer a post question. Oh yeah, yeah, we go as yeah. Well. No, no problem, and no problem. So, um, is an MBA a prereq for for the job, for the job as a PM in in uh, in Google? Because I know Google has like a lot of different layers of PM. <clears throat> sure. Uh, well, you know, I, let me let me give you my answer because I I just filled a uh, a position on my team with someone with an MBA uh, background. So I think it it definitely does help to have an MBA. However, not as much as the other stuff that we talk about. <laughs> not as much. And also, I don't have one. Right. Wow. And uh, and also like my experience diverges a little bit, John, from yours, where I actually got my job at Google via resume application, not internal referral, not recruiter reach out, just pray, like apply and pray, which spray and pray I also works. think spray and pray, which I also think is ridiculous. Don't do that. But I happen to have you wouldn't do it again. And, <laughs> and you know that's not how you're gonna get your next job. <laughs> But what I'm saying is, so I think there's uh, just like, again, with prioritization, we have different groups of folks that we are trying to help here. And I think there's going to be, everybody should definitely heed your message and use LinkedIn properly and get to know people on LinkedIn and actually approach them like a human being as opposed to a robot and actually see how they can be useful or how can they ask someone else to, to, to share some information with them because people do like to help each other. But ultimately, there's going to be some folks that are going to need to uh, spray and pray at a certain point. And I don't think that we should dissuade them from doing that. I think it should be low priority. I think everything you're talking about first, then eventually you can actually go and just see the jobs you want and, and actually try to ap apply to them and reach out to the hiring managers and, and beyond. So, but going back to your question, I think if you can show that you've done the work because a hiring manager and a recruiter are looking for slightly different things, but ultimately they're looking for someone who has done the work before mm. and has had some results that they can show for it. If you can demonstrate those things on your resume in one page, as I always like to say, don't, <laughs> one don't, go, don't go above one page. Just demonstrate <laughs> this is that. A senior PM at Google saying this. This is pretty awesome. Yeah, so that's, Ruthless prioritization, that's man. Is. Exactly. So the reality is like i'm not gonna read a four-page resume period <laughs> like i'm just not i don't have time to read a four-page resume even though it usually is happens that the folks that have four-page resumes sometimes will actually have a lot of meaningful experience but i literally don't have the time to read it because i have so many other resumes that are one page and tightly written and bolded for me <laughs> so that i know what to read so i can get done with it in 14 and a half seconds so those are some some realities. But and then I will look at the resume and if if there's stuff stuff in there that makes me think that you've done the work and you've had the impact, I don't care if you had an MBA or not. But if you don't, it's great to have an MBA. If you have both, yeah. all the better. If you have neither, then you got to do a little bit of you've got to do some digging and figure out okay, how can you show that you can do this work, you've done something similar and and try to build that out. Yeah, yeah. So shout out to everyone that's showing us love and is loving yeah. the webinar so far. Thank you, Michael, who appreciates the in-depth responses from us. Very informative. You know, Victoria is mentioning LinkedIn is how she found out about this webinar. So she agrees. LinkedIn is a life changer. Um, so we're, we're, we're happy we're changing your life, Victoria. You know, Jeffrey, you know, asked the question, how did you showcase your AI product expertise on LinkedIn? I created a whole bunch of content, Jeffrey, and I created a whole bunch of content every single day. So it was just the consistency of content creation was how I was able to showcase my competency. And keep in mind, y'all, you know, LinkedIn is this wonderful avenue for you to showcase how smart you are, what you know, and even if you don't know it all yet, what you're learning, right? And I think a lot of people forget that, you know, social media, social networking, is half showing up and the other half being consistent, showing up and then being consistent. And, you know, for me, when I 
work, was working with Microsoft when I got into Microsoft, I was still in grad school, right? Like, I just wanted to stand out because I realized everyone was going the spray and pay, pray route, but I could grow this, go this route of building my personal brand. And from there, that's unfolded to mega opportunity. It's how I met John. Like, it's literally how I met John. It's how we've, you know, built an awesome business together. But more importantly, it's it's what's led me to be really confident in building my own business now, too, and, and, and you know, and, and building a company, right? Like, all of these things cascade up to really launching and, and progressing your career. You know, uh, another question I'm seeing is, I'll be saying, John, you talk a lot about engaging and posting on LinkedIn, but how can I find, realize what I can talk about, John? Talk to us, man. How can how, how how can she understand what she can talk about? So John, you're muted, bro. Classic. That's three times for you, John. You're Sorry, gonna man. you're gonna be out the three next strikes, time. Strikes, man. Um, okay, all right. So what Tim and I preach so much and we believe in so much is speaking solely about what you love. And if you don't yet know what you love it's important for you to start writing about what, like Alex says, energizes you versus de-energizes you. Mm. If you sit down to write a post on LinkedIn, the authenticity will immediately come out on things that you want to write about. And if you sit down and go, you know what? I have no desire to write about product management. Not at all. Zero. But I really want to write about gardening. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm dead. I'm literally dead serious. I'm dead serious. You totally. should be thinking about the buckets in your life that spark interest and people get, people kind of get wrapped up in this idea that they have to brand themselves a certain way and they have to brand themselves in a corporate way, which is the worst thing you can do. Yes, I agree. You have to have those corporate elements about you, right? Because that's how people find you and recognize that you have the skills for the role. But it's the things that you do outside of work that you're passionate about that add the layers of complexity and color to who you are and make you more than just a resume. Mm. It makes the people who also believe what you believe to connect with you and say, I believe what you believe. That's awesome. We should have a conversation. And so... I think it's critical because you got to you got about you got to think about this as a time horizon. There's a time horizon of consistently talking about the things that you love and a couple buckets will emerge for you. And those buckets are your brand. The combination of those buckets will become your unique 100% you brand. Good so, stuff, John. That's it. <laughs> that's your brand. That's your brand's that's your essence. Brand. You know, so uh, man, we're getting so many questions, y'all. You know, well, let me let me just in, interrupt this program and say that we're gonna have to do a couple more of these sessions. We so have to. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. We've got to use some software where we can really line up the questions. I know. And see them. I, know. So I, I think we'll get back to you on that. We'll have our, uh, you know. Uh, research department, look into this. Research department, <laughs> us. We get this done. <laughs> Which is us. So, you know, Ed, Ed is asking, hello, Tim and t Jim and Tom. <laughs> I love that. Jim and Tom. Thank you so much, Ella. Anna. so hello, John and Tim, I'm guessing is what you're trying to say. I hope you're doing well. I have six plus years of marketing and analytics experience, and I'm currently pursuing my master's, my master's at MIS right now. I'm considering product management as a career path. How can I proceed further? What kind of skill set should I be developing? So we touched on, th on this a little bit earlier, Anna. Uh, you know, one of the skill sets is one being able to be calm, understanding how to prioritize, but also understanding that to differentiate yourself when it comes to product management, you do have to have some sort of portfolio of work. Uh, John and Alex, do you want to add to this? Because I, I feel as if we've, we've touched on this earlier. Sure. Uh, John is probably muted, so I'll take this question. Uh, <laughs> I was answering questions. I was answering questions. <laughs> good, good stuff. We got we to tag team it. So I think the portfolio, and, and also I would love to hear, Tim and, and John, your, your take on this, but portfolio of product management's work is, yeah, just stuff like, and again, at a high level, it's like solutions to people's problems that you've been involved in. Yeah. If you can just demonstrate that that's that's your portfolio and if you have none of that which by the way is totally possible if you're just starting out then as you're learning about product management as you're you're, you're visiting us and asking your question start looking into how you can how you can build some stuff that will help one 
person. And by the way, that one person can be you. You can solve your own problem and build a product for that and then see if anybody else has a similar problem. Yep, 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 yep. By the way, you all, thank you all so much for all of the love and questions. That means you all are actually paying attention. So that's a great yes. signal. And more importantly, thank you all for those of you who have been tagging us on LinkedIn and sharing what you've learned. You know, there's a lot of questions that, you know, we aren't able to get through. And that's just because there's so many people tuning in. But as Alex and John have said, we might have to do a few more of these in the future for some of you. And more importantly, for those of you who are interested in, you know, connecting with John and I some more, we do have a Patreon community that you can join. And we have a link of that embedded that you can click on, as well as Alex has a newsletter that you can join as well uh, on his website. So make sure that you reach out to him on his website and join John and I's Patreon community. All right. So, you know, John and Alex, you know, we are we are going strong and thank you all so much for tuning yeah. in and it's been an hour so far, but it yeah, feels like, it's only been like we yeah, strong, 20 but... minutes. Right. Yeah. You know, and I, I kind of want to, I want to touch on something right now. That's really contextual remote work. Mm. Right. Now, you know, every, now you, if you're interested in product management, it's not on site anymore. Right. You have to be able to lead a product team or be a part of a product team from the comfort of your own home. You know, how do people, and we, it's funny, we haven't seen this question yet. How can people find remote product management positions? One, and number two, how do you stand out if you are starting um, with the company as a remote product manager? I got a crazy theory about this, John. Can you take this one first and then I'll, I'll, I'll do mine? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I think this one's pretty fascinating because right? this, this is like a once in every hundred year type of a scenario, right? This is yeah. kind of worse than Great Depression. We're all kind of settling into this new normal, which, as you can see, will probably continue for a while, right? You have flare ups of COVID-19 happening again uh, in, in China. That's going to continue for a while until we have herd immunity and there, there likely won't be a vaccine for a while. So, like, there's a reality here that we probably have to face with remote work. Um, and, you know, there are plenty of companies that are going to come to that realization pretty soon. And they're already adapting with vi the video collaboration tools and all the different things that they have to do. And honestly, you know, I think companies used to be scared about lack of productivity when it came to remote work, keeping tabs on people. But that's really an old school mentality, I believe. Right? Mm -hmm. If you're getting paid well in a top tech organization, there's an expectation that you're going to do your job. You're going to have enough intrinsic motivation to do your job. And um, and you don't have to be babysat, right? You have to babysit mm -hmm. somebody who's working for $10 an hour, who's a college kid or whatever. You don't have to babysit us. Like we just do our work. And, um, and so, you know, we set up team happy hours and things like that. And so we're going to settle into this new normal we're going to leverage these collaboration tools and companies are going to just start hiring again, like top tech. Look at Amazon stock and Facebook stock uh, and Google, you know, some of the highest stock prices ever, mm. right? Ever. And we have to think about what companies are actually growing and expanding during this time of COVID-19 and what companies are shrinking. And we have to kind of direct our attention to, okay, what's the next five years going to be look like, looking like? I need, to, I need to pivot into a product management role in an industry that is sustaining touchless technology, right? Touchless grocery stores, medical device related things for rapid testing, uh, genome project type things. Like there's, there's all these different fascinating things. So, um, so I think, you know, as far as applying to jobs, it, it comes down to, um, the same principles that you do in insight on-site interviews, smiling, seeming comfortable, right? Having some pretty good lighting, not a ton of distractions and being able to articulate your, your value as an individual and, and your achievements. I love it. I love it. Great answer, John. What about you, Alex? Thoughts on this? What's your theory? Uh, plus one, plus one, all that. My, my theory is that, uh, uh, due to this very, very unfortunate and 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 tragic situation that has uh, that has befallen our world, uh, I think that actually a lot of us who are fortunate enough to be able to work remotely right now uh, are going to not like it, but a lot of us are going to like it, and that means that there might be a shift that is going to last longer than the effects of the epidemic. Mm -hmm which means that we might see 
more people in more jobs, roles, and, and backgrounds actually start to work remotely. And so, and so I think that we're going to look at a lot of jobs differently than we do now. And the second takeaway from that is I, what I think is coming is that it's a great time if you are not located, you don't happen to uh, live in Mountain View, California, you can actually try to get a job at any company that you want. It's a good. It's a good time to look at all of those companies and think about okay, where where can you, where can you possibly join? Because the the talent pool is global and will continue to increase. Mm. Be so. Mm. Yeah, wow. that, that, that's that's really interesting, Alex. That you said that, man. Because you know, it used to be like the geography mattered a lot. Like recruiters would filter you on, well, do they live in Mountain View or do they already live in Seattle? And that, because like, they don't, they don't want to have to think about like reload packages and all that stuff. <laughs> I mean, they, they, I mean, that's the reality, right? Like they want somebody as quick as possible because the team just wants to fill the role. It's not like a bias thing. They just want to fill the role. And um, so they're looking, they're tapping the local talent first, but now it's interesting. It's like, well, the talent doesn't have to be local anymore. So people who are in India, and people are in other locales. It actually, it a actually shrinks the, um, you know, shrinks the market. It's really fascinating. I, li I actually like that. I think that's beneficial to to the talent pool right now out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, wh what's that saying goes right? Uh, uh, talent is uh, opportunity is not, or something like that. I forgot the saying. Uh, I, for I don't know, man. I don't know. Gosh, you know, talent is. Opportunity is not equally distributed, but talent always is. I don't know. Oh, that's interesting. It's this really, yeah. yeah, it's this really, really powerful quote that speaks to how talent is everywhere, but often opportunity is not, right? In terms yeah. of giving people yeah. access that's, to that's, that's, work. Yeah. Right. And I think, you know, what we're seeing, you know, we even read today, you know, Facebook has said, you know, our employees can stay home for as long as they want, right? Twitter's already said, yeah, stay home as long as you want. And I think for <laughs> anyone who's looking to work with, you know, top tech companies or any company right now, you know, look for remote roles on platforms like Flex Jobs, you know, platforms like Indeed are now having a lot of remote roles as well. And yeah. even LinkedIn is starting to showcase a lot of different remote job opportunities on their platform. So I think right now, if you are looking for gigs, don't feel as if you have to, to be tethered tether, or maybe even international, right? This is an opportunity for you to do that. By the way, let me, I, I do want to do a caveat here because, you know, we're, we're going to tell you, I think, as, as honestly as we can about everything. Yeah. And so the caveat is twofold. Number one, obviously, uh, the epidemic it probably does affect the pace of hiring, maybe in the, in the short term. I think I'm personally optimistic in, in midterm and long term. Number two, there's, there, as John alluded to, there's been a lot of uh, bias towards places like Seattle or the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. That bias, you have people relocating to that area that want to work in these fields. And so uh, the, the competition basically, if you imagine uh, multiple people are applying for, for a particular position and one of these people wants to actually move to the Bay Area and then apply without having any, any guarantees. All things being equal, that person is still going to have a, an advantage. We think that it's going to be less of an advantage in the coming years, mm. but traditionally, it's always been an advantage because of exactly what what John what John said. So these hubs these hubs definitely happen, whether it's demand force or supply force or both. But they are a little bit of a reality of our of our world, and our hope and thought is that. It, it is going to thaw out a little bit and enable the global community to, to move around. Hmm. Well said, man. Yeah, Powerful. I agree. Powerful. So I am looking through some of the questions right now. You know, uh, a few people are saying that they're having trouble seeing you, John. Yeah. Morales? All of us, I think. <laughs> Someone just froze. How do we refresh the page? Me? I don't know. I don't want to lose all this chat. <laughs> okay so, so a few of you all are refreshing and once again you know uh, thank you all to you all who are tuning in and have been tuning in for an hour and 10 minutes now you all are amazing and awesome and thank you to the people who have been tagging us on linkedin and my my phone is like blowing up right now as we do this webinar we appreciate you if you are learning something from this webinar i mean alex and john have been sharing all kinds of gems and i've just been 
partaking here and there. But please tag us, mention us. We are going to be sharing all of your content as soon as we finish this webinar, and we're going to be boosting your posts as much as possible. You know, John, Alex, I want to dive deep on something, right? And I, yeah. I kind of want you guys to summarize a few of the things that we, we've been talking over, yeah. right? You know, because a lot of people have been talking about, okay, what skills do I have? You know, how does my empathy and communication show up in a resume? I can't do it, right? What does my portfolio look like? And some of the things we've been saying is that your portfolio can be your body of work. Like it could be an event that you orchestrated, whatever, like Alex, like you mentioned, whatever you're doing to push the needle. You know, for me, my portfolio was I built communities, right? And I was building bots and that's what got me into Microsoft. And now I, I'm building a company, right? And like your portfolio is always being created. Like people see your portfolio, even on LinkedIn, you know, and, and you know, I feel as if, you know, even with us three, there's, there's certain skill sets that we have that we're really great at. It comes natural to us, but a lot of people may not have it. So I want to, I want you guys to summarize here, you know, and I'm going to start with you, John. Yeah. What are the three skills, three skills that you think one needs to become a highly effective product manager? And John is muted. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, five, four, four, five times. Shit. Uh, yeah. So, uh, as far as three skills, man, that's an interesting question. Uh, to be an effective, powerful question. Yeah, it is a powerful question. Um, to try to summarize it, uh, I'm just wondering. You know, one of the things is, uh, I mean, for me is I may not have all the data at the time that I'm trying to make a decision. So I still have to have kind of a bias for action, right? I still have to take action. I can't just stagnate and say, well, I don't have the data. I don't have enough information. And one of the things that I, that I love doing is just taking a statistically significant sample of something. Because I think a lot of people don't realize like measuring something that I want to do is probably one of the most critical things as a PM. What is my mm. goal? So I've come, I, first of all, it's communication to the engineering team. So ruthless prioritization, probably number one, right? Based on the customer. I'm prioritizing on behalf of my customer, not my business leaders. Because if my business leaders don't know the customer, then they're prioritizing their own goals. And I'm having to fight with them and say, guys, our customer, boots on the ground, they, this is what they want, right? So being able to advocate, fight, communicate, right? Just kind of rolled up into one ball. But then once you do that, it's like, how do I measure it? And the simplest way to measure it is to take a statistically significant sample of something. If you have a population of a million users, then a statistically significant sample may only be a survey of 500, right? Which you could gather very quickly through a couple questions that you ask your community. And you're um, your engineers will say, okay, cool. Well, at least we have something, right? So being able to gather data for a goal and be able to articulate, I have a hypothesis. This is the goal that I have. And I'm not afraid to share that I'm trying to drive 50% growth in the next 12 months. So mm -hmm. it's articulation to the engineering team about what, about what needs to be built in the customer. It's to its goal setting. How do you how do you actually have the data to set a goal and be bold enough to say I'm going to do this thing? And I think number three is probably creating a roadmap because as soon as you create a goal, people are going to go, well, how the hell are you going to get there? Hmm. And then it's being able to say, here is my step flow. This is exactly the things that I'm going to do by the dates that I'm going to do it. Um, so yeah, th those are probably the three things that I'm on a daily basis. That's what I'm dealing with. So being able to prioritize, yeah, being able to be data data driven is, is yeah, is yeah. Com what you communication, communication, yeah. To, yeah. right? Uh, prior prioritization, uh, and, and then lastly, being able to create a roadmap. Yeah, data driven goals. Yeah, roadmap. Yeah, nope. that might be four, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, <laughs> top three in four, John. Well done. I, I would just say, yeah. first of all, uh, the fact that we did, we certainly did not rehearse or plan any of this in advance. So you and I overlap in most. We didn't play any of this, you all. Uh, not at all. Yes, I think I think uh, our chat understands. By the way, I think uh, they can tell that this is this is not planned. <laughs> so, um, but a lot of the stuff that you said, uh, that's my list as well. Uh, 
you've heard me talk about communication. I'm going to double up on it again. That's my form of communicating to you that is extremely important. So I'm going to just say that, that that's my first one. The second one is prioritization. John talked about that 100%. Nothing else really needs to be said. You've got to be able to, to, to get that done. And the third piece is roadmap. Totally, I agree. I would say I would up-level that a little bit and just call that organization. Mm. This is, by the way, I am... I shouldn't be saying this in a recorded video, but I am i am not great at this. I, I need mm. to be better at this. Oh, let me put it another way. This is right now an area that I'm trying to improve in. It's an area of opportunity? Yeah. Organization. <laughs> Organization. It's an area of opportunity for me, John. Thank you very much. That's and and honestly, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking for like, I've got backlogs running. I've got spreadsheets open. So when I'm talking to someone, I, I drop like at their name and the thing that I want to talk about. Like I'm probably on paper much more organized than the majority of people, but... What the impact of that is is still lacking. So I'm I'm still learning. I, I want to get better at that. I think it's extremely important. Organizationally, you've got to you're, you're basically tr you're juggling like a hundred different things, yeah. and you've got to be the one who who says, "Hey, by the way, did you do that thing?" Or we're like, "Where's that report?" Or did you fill in that deck? Did you send that email? Can I follow up? Hey, friendly ping, all right. that stuff. Like actually, it's you who should be doing it. Yeah. yeah. Well, Alex, Alex. So, okay. Let me, let me ask you something, man. Do you, um, and everybody in the, everybody in the, uh, who, who's listening in the way that Alex actually just answered that area of opportunity for himself is a great way to answer an area of opportunity question that arises in one of our interviews. <laughs> right. It's a great way because look at how, well, look at what he did. He approached that with a lot of humility. And he says, guys, you know, I hate to admit it, but it's just juggling a lot of things and trying to figure it out, trying to get better, right? Like when, when somebody sees that at an organization, they go, this person has humility. They know, they know where they need to work on, what they need to work on. And that, that's, really, that's really key. But one of the things that I want to know from you, Alex, is do you have to, as a PM at Google, write a lot of documents? I think as a PM anywhere, you have to write a lot of documents. But I, I, I yeah. think that also as I, as I kind of progress and get more experience and I, I, I'm starting to mentor a lot of different folks in different stages of their career. Uh, and what I'm finding is that writing documents is easier than producing a result of that document. So sometimes the more junior pms will con concentrate on like ironing out their documents and like having that all be uh, in line i think that you should definitely not under invest in that area because a document is is your like stake in the ground like, this is what i think about the world now you 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 and you please come and talk with me about this what do you think about this can we get movement here so it's it's definitely a stake in the world but i, I don't want I, I wouldn't want junior pams to over index on getting that document perfect you know how people can spend a lot of time like tweaking actually i can do like i do that if i like get really zeroed in on my document i'm gonna like change the formatting and should i use heading two or three for here and which color you don't want to <laughs> do that right you want to and what I see effective PMs and effective leaders do in my organizations and, and other places I've worked is they'll just like new doc, there's like no formatting. It's like, this is what I think about the world. It's literally a one pager, but the way a one pager is supposed to be, you just write down, here's the problem in the world. Here's how I want to solve it. What do you think? You don't like follow these templates that give you, you got to fill out these 15 things and write a business plan for it. No, no, you just What's the you have a thought. What's yeah, the you've got some data. Put it in here. Let's talk about. It. Yeah, yeah. So I, I just asked our lovely community and viewers. You know, which skills are you currently working on in your road to product management? Many of them are saying communication. Communication looks to be coming up to the top. You know, I'm trying to level up on my communication skills. Prioritization is a close second. Facilitation is a close third. I love watching and, this live too. This is this is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, decision making is a close third, and facilitation is like last. So thank you all for being humble and honest on what you're currently working on. You know, communication is incredibly critical. And I think it's something that we're constantly working on improving as PMs as well. There's, you can't master it. You're always trying to get better at it. You know, with that said, you all, you know, we are now opening things up for Q&A. Just feel free to ask whatever questions you want. You know, throughout the, the, the webinar, I've been doing my best to address some of the things that we outlined. And we've actually touched on all of them, as well as address some of the questions that you all have been asking. And now 
this is just time for you all to ask whatever you all want, and we'll try to get to it as much as possible. Um, since we have 362 people with us going strong, we really appreciate it. I want to showcase and give another reminder and say, hey, if you want to be a part of John and I's Patreon community, check us out, patreon.com, John and Tim. We're going to be sharing a lot of content, a live podcast, and we're going to even have a, a book club in that community. So make sure to check it out. We already have people who are signing up for our Patreon community, which is awesome. Also, Alex has an amazing newsletter for early career PMs, mid-career PMs, or if you're just trying to up-level as a PM, make sure you check out his website. It's pinned in the chat. So definitely check that out. Yeah. With that said, you know, this I'm good, seeing some questions. That's a good one over here, man. This is a good one. Yeah. Which one are you, which one are you seeing, John? Which one do you so want to start one, with? One dude wrote the same thing. How's the PM interview like? How's the PM interview like? How's the PM interview like? <laughs> And here, here, here's what I'll say about this. Here's what I'll say about this. Okay. So um, I'll use a different tech company as an example. Okay. So I had um, interviewed a while back at Uber and it was really fascinating. They asked me a question about, they, 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 it wasn't even a question. They just said, I want you to design a refrigerator for the blind. <laughs> and it was really ambiguous. Right. And they were just like, go. And what a junior individual would do is they would just start trying to solution. And they would say, okay, well, the refrigerator uh, needs to be this, and, um, and, and, and we, but what we probably need this thing, and we need a sensor over here, right? Just all this like random crap. They'll just start like throwing things out there. When somebody who's more seasoned, um, you know, or, or, or someone who's, you know, uh, uh, had some practice in PM is going to do is they're going to go, well, what is, what does the customer need? Who is the customer? What, yeah. why, what, why, 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 why I'm going to be asking a crap load of questions to the interviewer. And I'm going to be asking he or she, if the assumptions that I'm making are okay to be making, given that I don't have the information, Right. I'm asking I'm asking 20 questions of why. And ultimately, what I wound up finding out very quickly, the customer could have given two shits about a refrigerator. <laughs> OK. And that that was a trick question in the interview because they wanted me to figure out what the customer wants. As soon as I figured out what the customer problem was with that ambiguous statement. I was able to design a solution that had nothing to do with the refrigerator in the first place. Okay. So that, um, that you guys still hear, you guys hear me, right? Yeah. We hear yeah, we're with you. Man. We're with you. Loud okay, 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 cool. Cause some people say <laughs> five times off. You now I'm worried. Now right? I'm worried. Um, so, um, yeah, but, but that's that, you know, I think that's really critical, right? Because you're going to get hit with at Facebook, at Google at Microsoft at Amazon, you're going to get hit with like random questions. Mm. And, and and they might be, you know, hey, do this thing. Well, why should I do this thing? Right? That's our job as PMs to, to ask the why a million mm. times. Right? That's so that's my that's my thinking around the topic, right? So if you can if you can pose those questions to the interviewer and get to the root cause, the root customer problem, then you can ideate. And that's all we do, right? Well, like it's not like me or Alex or or, or Tim ever know the answer. Mm. We can hypothesize the answer. We can strategize. We can prioritize based on our hypothesis and the data that we have. That's the best we can do. So no, when you're when you're solutioning, nothing no, nothing is a wrong answer in your solution. And and these companies are largely looking for does the idea that this individual is trying to present to 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 me seem big or is it kind of small and mm. you know like is this person going to be able to think big for us right we're going to pay you a lot of money are they going to be able to think big for our organization or did they come up with a novel idea that was different from when i asked that question a hundred other times to other individuals so powerful man that's powerful that's powerful you got to be able to think 100 percent correct john 100 percent that's what I'm here for, man. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> so Jack is asking, what can I be doing this summer to build my portfolio, personal brand? I want to position myself in a way that allows me to succeed in my job hunt. <sighs> Woo! You know what? Jack, you got to you got to you got to start tomorrow, man. You got to start tomorrow. You know, we, you know, John and I and Alex, you know, we are gritty like that. You know, product managers, you got to be gritty. You know, it's it's this 
I think the art of it all is that there's no one that's going to just give you an opportunity if they don't see you putting in the work. And I, I want to be very frank about that because, you know, it's getting into product management wasn't easy for me. But because I was able to communicate my value proposition so well, and I've been consistent since since I since I committed to myself, I want to be in, in product and I want to build really cool things. A lot of great things have happened to me, right? And I think Jack, you know, if you are gritty enough to say, okay, I know that you know I want to be a product manager. I know I need to up level on my personal brand. The world is yours. Like LinkedIn isn't going anywhere anytime soon. I think more than more importantly, the way you have to stand out now is you have to actually build a personal brand. Like there, you can't you can't mistake it. You know, there's no way you can't even go to a networking event or a career fair anymore, right? None of that exists, right? You have to do things. <laughs> you have to do things such as building your personal brand. You have to be reaching out to people who are influencers in their industry. That's literally how you're going to get visibility, right? So you know, you kind of have to realize that your hands are tied right now. But when 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 there's opportunities like this, you know, this is an opportunity for you to step up and really showcase what you got, Jax. So, you know, I, I want to encourage you to get gritty, but gr get gritty and have fun with it. Right. It's all a learning process. Alex, what are your thoughts, man? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm in power mode answering questions in chat. <laughs> that's that's what I'm doing, Tim. I'm, we we got to be we got to be approaching this from multiple angles. So is the question uh, about personal brand? Yeah, 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 yeah. So you the guys are the experts. Is about you guys are the experts. I, I would just advise you to stick with John and Tim. That would be my advice because that's what I'm doing. <laughs> that's what I'm doing. I'm subscribed to their letter. I'm gonna be their pay, you know, on their Patreon. <laughs> See, there we, so, go, there we uh, go. I'm very excited about it. Yeah, uh, yeah, man. That that personal brand thing, guys. Like, it's so it's so weird because like when people think of personal branding, it's it's uh, it's so misunderstood. Yeah. It's so misunderstood. You know, there's some comments in here like, well, you know, like, what do you, what do you, what do you do with the personal brand? Why do you even have it? What's the value? Guys, the value is infinite. If, if, if my company today told me that I need to leave, if I had a choice between scrubbing my personal brand from the internet or continuing my job, I would leave. I would resign tomorrow even though I'm getting paid really well mm -hmm. because I can't do that. My personal brand, I've been building it for four years and now opportunities are coming to us, um, you know, uh, so frequently because of what we built, right? We're growing a community around, uh, around the message that we have and that's infinitely scalable. So, um, so yeah, it's really, it's really incredible guys. It's powerful stuff. Yeah. It, it, so you know, thank you, man. We have three hundred. We still have three hundred forty-four people. people. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> we're still doing it. And look how you know John and Alex and I. We don't even look like we're tired. We look like we can go on for two ah, more I hours. Going all night because it's not energized. You, us, you know? We're gonna have to I figure out a way to to approach some of you know break it down into topics and like approach because there's so many questions on so many so, pipelines. Yeah. John and I are gonna prioritize yeah. this stuff. Set it we'll up. Time. Have to do a bunch of the black logs. And you know what? You know what? One of the things that we're probably going to be doing, John and I, we have our Patreon community, so check it out. We're probably going to be doing live bi-weekly streams with Absolutely. Alex. Where we talk and go into on more stuff oh, about this. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. even go more into how do we balance our lives as product leaders. So definitely join our Patreon community yeah. and also make sure that you join Alex's newsletter because we that's where we're going to be sharing all of the behind the scenes details and, and gems that you all are probably really interested in learning more about. So we're definitely going to do this some more. I think yeah. more importantly, we want to thank you all for coming and showing up today. You know, this is, we had over, how many people sign up, John? 2.30 yeah. in the morning in Nigeria right now. I know, I, mean, I saw awesome. that. Man. That's what I'm talking about. Thank that's you very awesome. much for coming. We had, right, that's crazy. That's awesome. We had 2,000 people register for this. 2,000. Um, yeah, we just crossed 2000, like right before the webinar went live. And I know a lot of people, um, a lot of people for, are from out of the country and, and, and specifically wanted to get the replay. So we will have a replay as well. Guys. Over 2000 people are going to be watching the replay. Yeah. 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 And be, and be sure to share the replay with your friend who wants to get into product or, you know, wants to know Alex, John and I, and yeah. be, be our friends on LinkedIn. Yeah. And more importantly, you know, a lot of you are already sharing my phone's blowing up what you've been learning from this webinar, mm -hmm. continue to do that. We're going to be engaging with all of your posts 
And I think once again, yes. we just want to thank you all. You know, John, Alex, how do you all, you know, what are some of the takeaways that you all want to leave with our amazing community and audience? Uh, I would say um, don't, so don't wait. I think it's awesome that you, that you came out here and, and hung out with us. We're going to continue to do this. But ultimately, I think our goal is to get you out there and, and, and doing things that are going to make you happier. And so one of, the, one of the ways that I used to get stuck is in perpetual education mode. And uh, some of the folks, you know, I watched a lot of John's videos actually before before yeah. we met, yeah. and and I took inspiration from that. Yeah. Um, and and you, you know, do that. That is awesome. I think this community is great. I mean, yeah. Hearing your comments that you've been enjoying, you know, the energy and and, yeah. and uh, the way that we we're, we're communicating. Uh, but also jump into action. Like see what you can do tomorrow. I would say today, but two thirty a.m. I don't know what you can do. To, to yeah. Go to sleep. You got <laughs> to get sleep. some sleep. Go sleep now. Yeah. So boy, you got to get some sleep. Yeah. And uh, and but tomorrow, you know, it's uh, I was gonna say it's a Saturday. It's a Friday. Don't get ahead of myself. But you yeah. you can see what you can do tomorrow. Little steps consistently, more like a marathon than a sprint. And and we'll be we'll be here to help you along. Yeah. 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 Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I think it's just so critical to understand what direction you want to take in your life. And one of the things that Tim and I talk about pretty often is that we spend over 2000 hours a year in jobs and often try in those jobs to solve pretty complex problems, regardless of what job family that you're in, whether it's sales or project management or product management. And it's pretty interesting that a lot of people in life feel lost. There's a big, big sense of kind of, you know, uh, people not knowing the direction that they should take their lives because we have the paradox of choice at, at hand. And there's a million different things we could do. All of them sound great. And then we have forces of Instagram, which kind of make us feel like, well, that looks really cool too. Right? Uninstall. Yeah, uninstall, right? And so there's, so there's all of that. And um, so we often kind of go through life as a rudderless ship. And one of the things that Tim and I, you know, we're often preaching about is you got to have that rudder. You got to know exactly where you're going to go. And the only way to know where you're going to go or where you want to go is to prioritize in your own life where you want to go by taking the time. Instead of spending just 2000 hours of work, go home and think about how many hours a year am I spending on any kind of personal development whatsoever? Mm. Is it five? When was the last time I read a book, right? Is it 10 years? Let's start to reassess some of those things. Where are you kind of, where's your fountain of knowledge from? Where are you gaining inspiration? Yeah. And, 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 and so you, you gotta establish a rudder, but the only way you can establish a rudder is by doing things like personal branding, writing, and I look at mm. personal branding as literally just scaled journaling. All Tim and I are doing every day is we are journaling our thoughts to the world. And people are commenting on our posts. It's making us think critically about what we're saying, why we're saying it, seeing different viewpoints. It's constantly pressure testing our ideas. And, um, and it's, it's giving us a massive amount of clarity. So, yeah, I, that's, I think that's the key takeaway. Find your rudder. And the only way you can do that, there's no, there's no, there's no like golden path to finding your brother. There's no golden path to finding your why. The only golden path to doing it is you got to put in the time because everybody has their own unique story and their own, you know, jumble of thoughts in their head that you have to put out somewhere. Mm. Mm. Take action and find your rudder. Got to find the rudder. Got to, yeah, it does. Find the it does. I love it. I love it. And you all have joined us on the amazing webinar yeah. on how to break into product. Thank you all so much. We really do yeah. truly appreciate you all. Thank you guys. Once again, make sure to join yeah. Alex's amazing newsletter where he shares a lot of insights for aspiring PMs. And be sure to join John and I's Patreon community. We have over 10 people, I believe, who have just signed up while we were doing this webinar alone. So we really, truly appreciate you all. And there's going to be a lot of behind the scenes goodies we have in our community yeah. and in our newsletter as well. So with yeah. that said, you all, thank you all so much for tuning in. You know, we're going to go to LinkedIn now and just like engage with all of you all who have been blowing us up yes. and <laughs> post, post something, post the number one key takeaway that you learned tonight. Okay. Number one yep. key takeaway. Each one of us 
are going to get that tag. The beauty of tagging on LinkedIn, the beauty of reaching out to people and doing a tag is that I see it immediately on my phone, right? And everybody's carrying their phone with them, right? So that's that dopamine yeah. rush. We all get that dopamine rush. We see that you wrote an awesome comment. And, um, and then if you have some additional questions, we can help you clarify those questions from your post yeah. in, in the comments of your post. Okay. Thank Why don't you guys, you guys start a shark tank? A shark tank. <laughs> a shark tank. We, we, we're we're going to do a lot of exciting We're game. Stuff. We're game. We're game. That's actually right. brilliant. That's brilliant. All right, y'all. We'll talk to y'all soon. All right, guys. We'll Thanks see so you. much. See you later. Peace.